Welcome to Monarchist Minute. I'm Victor Smith. And in this Holy Week, we remember the sufferings of a great many people. Just as this week, the church asks us in a very special way to meditate on the passion of our Lord, we must remember the struggles of what certain people are going through. Some meteorologists are speculating that Tornado Alley is moving east as the state of Ohio has had 26 tornadoes yep. within the past uh, year or so. I believe that's last just, week was a... That's just within the season. No, I mean. that the, oh, uh, just the within whole... the season. Okay, so <laughs> just within this tornado season, the state of Ohio has had 26 with the highest category they have 16, had. Not 26. Of 16. Yeah, it, excuse it, it, me. 16 tornadoes. The yeah, state of Oklahoma but, has only had six. Okay. Which is, um, as a proud resident of the state of Ohio, I have never seen anything like this in the 23, almost 24 years I've lived here. And there is currently 11 counties in the entire state of Ohio that are under a federal state of emergency, which I can't think of a time that's ever happened. Um, the primary community impacted was Lake... I can't remember if it's called Lakeside or Lakeview. I'm pretty sure it's Lakeview, which is up by Indian Lake out in the western part of the state. And the community was almost wiped out. We... We are yeah. thankful, though, that um, it was only a Category 3. If it was an F4, yeah. F5, I can only imagine how destructive... Oh, hell, it would be a nightmare. Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, when, when, you thought, when you thought that the whole East Palestine situation is worse, oh, it's... It, yeah, it's all... Get worse in Ohio. The East Pal... Oh, you just gave me flashbacks to that East Palestine situation. Honestly, while East Palestine was bad, most of that was um was hysteria. Like people blowing it way out of proportion, but eleven counties under federal state of emergency, a huge portion of western Ohio. That is there is nothing to be there's no hysteria going on here. This is genuine destruction on a level my state has never seen in at least my memory at least oh. not since the um 70s and 80s when we were getting rocked by historical blizzards Moving on uh, a lot of unluckiness uh, happens in the state of ohio uh, okay okay as we okay Moving on <laughs> uh, we remember the people of ohio we also remember the, peep, the struggles of the people of Haiti this Holy Week. We didn't get a chance to talk about this last week as we had no show. Uh, there was, the president of Haiti has fled the country and there has been essentially a de facto coup by someone who is nicknamed Barbecue. And we also received sad news that Catherine, the Princess of Wales, is undergoing yes. cancer yes. treatment. I mean, it's a horrific set of odds that after we learned that the king himself is struggling with cancer, that we learned that Catherine is as well. And, you know, it's it really has been a hard past couple of years for the royal family, and the press has been giving them no breaks whatsoever in regards to this. Yeah. Uh, like, this, seriously. Okay. And I'm actually going to juxtapose this to something that happened earlier today as we are recording this. Um, the owner of Baltimore Orioles, Peter Angelos, just passed away today is announced by the Angelos family and the Baltimore Orioles. And, peep, and Peter Angelos, despite being one of the most hated men 
in sports ownership, the second worst owner in the history of Baltimore sports behind a certain Ursay. He was a philanthropist. He was a self-made billionaire. He represented people dealing with asbestos cases. And he was the only owner in Major League Baseball to refuse to play scab players after the 1994 players strike. He also made some very horrible personnel decisions regarding the Orioles. But Pete yeah. Angelos received more respect from the Baltimore media than the British royal family has received from the global media. Yeah. Does that make sense, people? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. it really doesn't, but insert um, C.S. Lewis quote when men are denied kings their honor, yada, 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 etc. Yeah, I think... Right. Oh, so, back to um, Haiti. So, I think once Haiti was a kingdom... Was it uh, a I don't... I uh, think Haiti it was, it was... was a colony under the Kingdom of France... Napoleon, uh, sorry, not Napoleon. Uh, after the, after Louisiana, after uh, the king was deposed in the French Revolution, the Haitian slaves started a slave revolt and was actually the only slave revolt to have won against their masters. Mm -hmm. And after Haiti left, there was no real reason for the French to keep Louisiana. So Napoleon sold Louisiana to us at a cut rate price. But to um answer your question, Frederick, um Haiti had sort of that um Napoleonic monarchy where their revolutionary leader fashioned himself as a monarch and reality was just dictator sort of thing. And we may even, and, and I think with the ascent of this barbecue man, we may be uh, heading back to that sort of yeah. dictator-like yeah, status. Um, well, However, the Haitians are, oh boy, this is the part where I'm grateful that I had the French professor I had in college because she has worked with the Haitian people for a very mm -hmm. long time. She has helped an NGO that has been in Haiti, helping to build, helping to make conditions better for the Haitian orphans. Um, that is a big problem in Haiti and orphanages are not very well funded because the country is very poor in the first place. So or you can imagine the state of orphanages in Haiti. They need all the help they can get. And um, so, while we're talking about why Haiti is so poor, I learned a very interesting fact on why Haiti is so poor. And unfortunately, the U.S. Yeah. is partly responsible for it. Yeah, um, like, I think... Because uh, the... Uh, it has because, to be a um, rice industry. Because I believe uh, there was a dictator in the past in Haiti called uh, Papa Doc, I think. I don't know about him, but what I do know is nice. that... He was called the, the voodoo dictator because mm -hmm. he claimed that he was some spirit that was responsible for the killing of JFK. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy, but, you know. it's. I mean, it sounds it, but... Um... I'm not saying that it's what I'm saying is that the U.S. is solely responsible for Haiti because we're not. But the there is this little tidbit about the U.S. pressuring Haiti to join the global market using their rice industry to get ahead. But then when the U.S. did this, they then, we then subsidized our own domestic rice industry, which caused Haiti's rice industry which was their one of their main exports to basically go yeah. bankrupt. 
then we um basically price yeah. gouged. And, the and plus also because of that um earthquake that they had. Oh, the earthquake was just insult and injury. Oh. Yeah, I think I yeah. Uh so it's and you know if the Haitian market was completely um unregulated, they wouldn't be able to stop growing things. The Haitian farmers have basically been tied I think their they... got their hands tied behind their back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, but also, wasn't it a sugar colony before it got? Basically, like, all of the Pacific, basically all of the Caribbean islands were sugar colonies. Yeah, like, why can't they just grow sugar and export that? I think they do actually, but the problem is that, like I said, everyone in the Caribbean grows sugar. Yeah. So it's not exactly a very un. A very um uncompetitive market, and of yeah. course, like and some um, other islands are better developed. They have better economic relations and everything. They have better equipment, well, better well, access. Well, I wouldn't say about their uh, western neighbor, who's uh, currently under a communist dictatorship. But wait a minute. Given what Haiti's going through, I will give. All the awards in the world to the Dominican Republic because apparently they at least know what they're doing. Yeah. The Dominican Republic, by the way, is their neighbor to be right, not to be left. Oh, I got my West and East mixed up. <laughs> no, it wasn't you, Will. It was Frederick who got his West and East mixed up. Oh, uh, let's. Uh... What? No, no. So... I was talking about Cuba. No, let's talk about oh, you're Cuba. You're talking about Cuba. Okay. Yeah, I was talking about we're how talking you know they're Cuba. yeah, like you you said that they're the other Caribbean uh you know islands were developed, and I said, well, well Cuba, what Cuba. about their um neighbors Cuba? westward because they're not very uh doing very well. I think Cuba is the exception, though. That rather than sugar, they were more known for tobacco. Yeah. But don't quote yeah, me e even even their na the native population before they were all wiped out smoked tobacco. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's okay. Um, a lot of people have undergone a lot, uh, and basically the whole point of what my opening statement was really supposed to be before we actually talked about these things a little bit more in depth, which I which I can appreciate, is that all of these sufferings that the people of Ohio, people of Haiti especially, and Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, is nothing compared to the suffering that our Lord underwent on Good Friday, which we are really supposed to be commemorating this week. And of course, also of the many martyrs, which unfortunately we have some new ones to be added to the list due to a recent terrorist attack that has been found to be religiously motivated in Russia. Oh. Religiously um, motivated? So is, it, so is it like uh, Orthodox Christians getting persecuted or is it something else? Um, It was an ISIS attack at the... um. Concert hall, ISIS has claimed responsibility, and they have claimed it was explicitly to kill Christians. Okay. Oh my. Uh, I don't have the exact casualty numbers uh, in front of me, but I know it was well over a hundred wounded. And dozens killed. Yeah. And, you what? know, it... It's amazing because for the longest time it seemed like ISIS was gone, that it wasn't a thing, and it seems like they're desperately trying to push themselves back into the world, back into the spotlight. And yeah, I thought they were all gone. Like this is like a the first time that I've heard about them since um 2019. It seems yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's and been like. I don't... Five years. I don't want to make a joke about such a horrible tragedy, but, you know, it seems like they saw everything that was going on in the world, Ukraine, Israel, 
And they got a little jealous that they weren't getting the spotlight anymore, but I don't want to make a joke about that like that, because it does seem insensitive, but yeah. it really seems like that's what they're trying to do, because it seems like every time something bad or horrific happens, you hear someone from one of these organizations try and claim responsibility. Yeah. Like they're desperately trying to cling on to relevancy. And all I have to say to that is, if your only claim to fame is causing human suffering, save the world, <laughs> your breath, and just take yourself out of the picture. And uh, I would like to... Yeah, it's sad. It's sad that those people exist. It's, I mean, it, like, here we go again. Every <laughs> single time the Islamic Ramadan comes around, it seems like yeah. terror attacks seem to increase. The infamous Ramadan rage, as it's supposedly called. Um, I've heard other names for that, but we will not mention those here. Our prayers go out to the families of those affected, of those 40 that have been killed in Moscow by ISIS. And I would like to turn this sad podcast upside down and around by referencing a photo that was released. You may have seen it on r slash monarchism on Friday, yesterday as we're recording this. A photo of His Majesty King Felipe and Princess Leonor of Asturias having lunch with the army in their fatigues. Both of them in fatigues. I did see that photo. It was so wonderful. It looked so nice. It it really made my day when I saw that because I think I was in the um right after hearing about the terrorist attack in Moscow and you know hearing about all the news with Princess Catherine and man this has been a really heavy week and it's like this yeah, is interesting that, this is that made interesting. my day honestly it, it's it's so good to see that you know through the good through the bad the horrible and the awful that. Good things still happen and life marches on. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the... And of course, let us remember that they were making good progress at getting rid of ISIS during the Trump administration. However, after the, um, shall we say, less than ideal withdrawal from Afghanistan... It's possible they made a uh, comeback in Afghanistan. Right. So let us. So let's actually talk. Let's actually give the photo <laughs> a bit more yeah. airtime because. Uh, also, you, also talking have, about um, these. Gentlemen, one more time, please. Okay. Well, when have you ever seen a sitting U.S. president in fatigues having lunch with common soldiers? When have well, you ever seen that? It's the, I think maybe Bush did, but I was really young during the Bush administration, so I can't remember. But to clarify I, for our viewers, he means Bush 43, not Bush 41. Yes, mm. I wasn't even born for 41. Yeah, yeah or two Bushes. But, um, yeah, I can't remember if Bush 43 served or not. I think he did, or that might have been 41. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not talking about serving. I'm not talking about serving of you on forces. I'm talking about as president, oh, right, eating right, lunch right, with right. common... Oh, right, right, right. I'm just saying, but in order for them to have fatigues, they gotta be able to serve. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm pretty sure Bush 43 did during like the early days of the war on terror in Iraq and everything. Yeah. But in again, the... I was really young back then, so don't quote me on that. Oh, okay. So apparently, yeah. U.S. presidents are barred from. Wearing military dress in office. 
Wait, what? This is news to me. Especially given how many pictures we've seen of Dwight Eisenhower wearing his officer's uniform. I'm pretty sure several of those were why he was in office, but don't quote me on that. It's interesting. Apparently the mission of... accomplished thing caused a lot of scandal because Bush was in fatigues. That's intriguing. Is it? I'm assuming it's like to not promote the idea of a militaristic president to like yeah because it seems too dictatorish or something i don't know but that that seems like because because we like to associate dictators with them wearing military uniforms right 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 but um, just and just the very fact that our president can't wear military uniform without causing scandal and yet here is the king of Spain wearing military gear, eating lunch with his daughter, with the regular troops of the Spanish army. Uh, I'm presuming unannounced. Truly. That, 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 that tells, that evokes a powerful image. Like, the president cannot be a common person, but a monarch can be. Yeah, and it's it, funny it gives because usually, if you listen to promote more of that, yeah. and it's funny because usually when you listen to Republican um, rhetoric, they always complain about how the monarch isn't among the common people and everything. But you know, there's no explicit rule that states that a Republican leader would be any more of a um. People's man. Um, yeah. Yeah, but also... What I'm looking for, a salt-of-the-earth like, kind of guy. The the proletariat Kaiser, because he mm-hmm. went to factories a lot to speak with the workers. And that's what leaders should do. Frankly, yeah. if I were a leader, that's what I would do, just for any reason that I can't stand formalities, and I would absolutely loathe court life. Yeah, it, um, a lot of us would love court life as because a leader, he, if you want to figure out your country's problems, it's best if you speak with the people and not, you know, get your and, advice from advisors. You know, and that goes outside of politics, and it goes into the realm of things like business and everything. Because it, someone who's been working in a major American corporation. I can't tell you that the biggest problem facing any business is that the people up front in the corporate office don't bother to ask people what they need to do. They it's, assume because they got their degrees and everything that they know best. Yes, and we'd like to welcome our Vice Chancellor, Clemens Magnolia, to the stage. Oh, hello, Clemens. How are you? Hello, uh, Vice Chancellor. What brings you here tonight? Uh, let's, all right, let's keep, uh, let's keep our conversation going about how, about this stuff. So, like, you see somebody like Mike Rowe, of course, he works a very dirty job, so I don't think it would be appropriate for him and his job anyway, but you see people, like, you don't really see the big head honchos taking a sh- taking a shift. <laughs> uh, yeah. Speaking of dirty jobs, now that you brought that up, is that show even still airing? Because that used to be I one of the, that used to be one of the best things on television in like the early two thousands. Yeah. Let me well. look. But um. I don't know. I don't mean to derail the conversation, but when you mentioned dirty jobs, I was invoked such a feeling of nostalgia, I just had to ask. Apparently, the series returned in January of 2022. Mm-hmm. Oh, it ended in February 2023. Oh, wow. How sad. That's sad. But, um, yeah, and 
I don't know. I think Scandinavia, but to backtrack to leaders who are associated heavily with commoners, I think Scandinavia has the um right recipe for this. For those of you who don't know, the Scandinavia monarchies are commonly referred to as the bicycle monarchies because you can literally just run into the king while he's on his bicycle going down the street. And Can you just imagine how surreal of an experience that would be? Yeah. Like, you're just waiting at an intersection and the king walks up next to you and asks you what the um time is or something. Or how's uh, the news looking? This and stuff. Like, and you know, I saw something else about this too. Watching a um clip from um HBO's um yeah. Adams, the show about um John Adams, and mm -hmm. in the comments, it because they were just casually walking through the streets of New York. John Adams and I forget who else was with them, and somebody in the comments said, and it's like. We can't even fathom getting that close to the president in the 21st century, and he's just sitting here walking down the street. It's like, and it's amazing to think of how out of touch leaders are in that way. But and of you course, know, of course, as as our friend Joe points out in the text chat, the president Joe Biden rides bikes. However, you can't get close enough to him because of the Secret Service, which is. Unfortunately, a part of life being the leader of our country, because we're the most powerful country in the world, people right, want right. to kill you. Right, yeah. and I get that. The, all the security and all the remoteness behind closed doors is unfortunately essential for the reality of the world we live in. But it, it's sad that we've lost that human touch with our leaders in the <laughs> But, you know. I um, recall during the campaign trail, Governor Ron DeSantis serving as a bartender at one of his campaign stops for a bit. That sounds like it'd be interesting, having your um drink poured by your governor. Yeah. Um, also, um, a lot of people have been saying about uh, Vieck not being the, the candidate. For Trump's VP, it's not technically true that he let's, won't be a pick because this is uh, saying. So I haven't heard anything about VPs for Trump yet. So it's yeah, like they're still talking about um who's going to be his VP. And uh, some senator guy said it'd be an honor to serve as a... I think, I think whoever Trump chooses for his VP is going to be what inevitably sells his candidacy. I think, I think uh, Vieck could be a good choice because he's young and he could enable to the young, younger voters to go out and vote for Trump. So you got to look at the options here. I don't know. I haven't learned enough about Vivek to um really have an opinion on him yet. To be honest, I haven't really followed the election as much as I can, just because, as much as I'd like, I mean, just because I, I haven't had time. But, um, you know, I kind of like Joe Kennedy. I kind of like um Kennedy Jr., if I'm not going to lie. All right, let's uh, not... get off the topic of the election. We're gonna have a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna have a long time to talk about the U.S. presidential election from now until election day. We are. So we are. Yeah, I believe we should do a full episode to that while we can. Probably closer to when debates start. Yeah, like primary debates, or something between uh, both sides. Well, well, um, I don't think the only primary debates there have been were the GOP debates, and I'm not yeah. sure that there's going to be debates between Trump and Biden. So let's so let's put a pin on this. Mm -hmm. Like like a three like debate. Like you have Kennedy. Let's put a let's put a, let's put a let's put a pin. Let's put a pin on this. Yeah, let's put a pin on that. 
Uh, so, and let's go back to talking about the accessibility piece. And right. people actually went into King Charles III for the British Secret Service, the Coldstream Guards, yeah. basically pulled them away. Interesting. The cold, the cold stream guard is, hmm, I, well, I don't know. The, I like the cold stream guard. Now, here's my question. Is there an element in the cold stream guard that is actually like, like the secret service? Or are we talking like the formal guard that we know that usually guards Buckingham Palace? The formal guard that we know. Okay, I didn't I, know if it was like the um Swiss Guard in the Vatican, where yeah, you have the um people who are dressed up in the classical uniforms, but there's like commandos hiding behind every window or some. And of course, uh, in modern times, monarchs have been guarded like our president because of assassination attempts. Yeah, so I don't. So I think that. The Scandinavian monarchs are the only monarchs you can really get close to. People, yeah. And that's probably because nobody really... There's no reason for them to be of any controversial nature since they kind of just are there. They, yeah, they're yeah. just right there. Um, I mean, yeah, of course they have some security, but it's not like high, high security. Yeah, also, Republicans that went on the attack against uh, Marcus and Nepal, saying that, no, we can't, you know, get rid of this Republican system. It's the um, Paul we gotta get rid of. Rep Nepalese Republicans are our Republicans. Yeah. No, the, the, the Nepal are you know, Republicans over there. Oh. Uh, and, um... There was a new um, Republicans in Nepal are not exactly very powerful, nor are they really anybody we should be paying attention to. <laughs> yeah, it seems like at this point they're just trying to do damage control. Yeah. Let's um let's let's move on. Said to, that. Let's move on to talk about but the main thrust of let's. I was going to what the monarchists over there said. They said without the king, they're more like refugees because you know it, they that feel is, that is an expected statement from a group of monarchists. Mm -hmm. Now let us and of course with um the um. The fact of um, Mao's dictatorship over, well, it, I don't know if we should call it a dictatorship, but I know the Maoist party is the dominant party, and whether or not um, Nepal can be considered a Chinese proxy state as a result is up in the air, but that's besides the point. That is beside the point. Let's get to the main thrust. This was supposed to be a Holy Week special, so let's talk about some Holy Week. So... I am going to inform you about a lovely tradition from Holy Week. On Holy, Thur Holy Thursday, another name for Holy Thursday is Maundy Thursday. We get the term Maundy Thursday from the term mandatum which is the right of the washing of the feet that may or may not take place on Holy Thursday in the post-conciliar rite and even in the 1955 Holy Week reforms of Pope Pius XII, the mandatum became a required part of the Holy Thursday liturgy. Or if not required, then if it was done, that's when it had to be done within the action of the liturgy. Uh, the 
Washing of the feet dates back to, of course, we read in the Bible that our Lord washed the feet of the apostles. And in certain countries, the monarch carried this forward and washed the feet of 12 poor subjects and treated them to a meal afterward. I believe the only monarchy in the world that maintains something akin to this is the United Kingdom, where they still hold the dinner, but not the washing of the feet ceremony itself. Yeah. But it is a very poignant reminder that the priest acting in the person of Christ comes not to serve, sorry, not to be served, but to serve, as King Charles III so eloquently reminded us in his coronation prayer that he said at the introduction to his coronation service. Yeah. The, and it is a, and, and I think that the actual washing of the feet should be brought back because it is a reminder to these monarchs that they are servants, first and foremost, the fathers of their people, the servants of their people. They are the ones that are to lead their nation through good times and bad. I am yeah. very, very surprised that President Biden hasn't taken that tradition of washing of the feet himself, especially when you consider the Super Bowl out of the sort of left wing he gets us group. No, which get me started on those. That's why I appreciate them trying to get people in the Jesus, and that's fundamentally good. I feel like also what they're trying to do is um a um what's the word I'm looking for? An essential yeah. misrepresentation of the fundamentals of Christianity as well. Yeah. And I think they're also like a Protestant group, so that's another red flag. Hey. Hey, hey. We didn't I the Protestant bashing was over when when the when our former podcast host and regular guest left the show. Hey. <laughs> Frederick, well, I might be Protestant, but at least people remember my church exists. Well, well. Anyway, <laughs> let us let right. us move on. Yeah. Let us move on and discuss a uh, part of the reason why it is called the mandatu is that it is. Because of the opening antiphon of the service, a rough English translation of it is, A new commandment I give unto you, saith the Lord, that you love one another as I have loved you. Which is very poignant considering what the priest is about to do in that moment. Right. Wash people's feet. Mm -hmm. And as people that are sort of that, as people that are monarchists, we should be looking to bring back good traditions that have been cast to the wayside because of things like the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, and even the so called glorious revolution, which was neither glorious nor revolutionary. <laughs> In, in a way, it could be seen as revolutionary because it deposed a monarch in favor of another one on the basis of religion. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's uh, let's get uh, off of that sad subject and let's end on a yeah. Also, the uh, first week of uh, Orthodox Lent. Yes, um, happy Lent for all of our Orthodox, um, viewers, but, um, 
I know it's it, weird. It, it gets confusing for me because I know some Orthodox churches use the revised Julian calendar, which puts them in line with the West, and some don't. So I, it's so hard for me to keep track of all that. Yeah, yeah. Which is why all the churches should be using the modern Gregorian calendar, so everybody can be on the same page. Let's not start this fight. Let's start this argument. Because all right, we can we can do it. We can discuss and debate this later. Anyway, I yeah, think it is stuff. time that we close up. If you would like oh, to, wait, 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 close up already? Nah, we still got plenty of time. We have plenty of time. All right, let's. Yeah, let's we gotta make up for lost time last week. There's no reason to be in a hurry. <laughs> All right, let, all right then. Let's do a let's do a well, very special. Well, hang on a second. I have something I wanted to do. Okay. And so something my pastor and I talked. Of, something my um one of my pastors discussed when it comes to Lent is, especially when it comes to fasting in Lent. Is that the reason you fast during that? The reason you give something up is when you feel empty without that thing, it's supposed to remind you of how empty it feels to not have Christ in your life. And you're supposed to use that time to think about and reflect on your nature, on your relationship with God. And so what so, I want to do is I want to talk about Lent in review. Now, now, of course, Frederick, I'm sorry that you're not really going to have a chance to participate in this considering you just started Lent. But I want to talk about what we have found in our times to over these past five weeks to about our relationship with God. What have we found out about ourselves? about our relationship with God, and how we can become closer to God. Ooh, that is a very good question. One that I honestly wasn't prepared for. I'm going to have to have a think on that. But what I can tell you early on is that on Ash Wednesday, I attempted to pray the Divine Office. If you don't know what the Divine Office is, the Divine Office is the what we call the official prayer of the Church. It is the prayer that all priests and religious are bound to say on pain of sin. It basically, and if you traditionally did it, it would take you through all 150 Psalms in a week. I tried it on Ash Wednesday. It was a little too hard. Yeah. It took a long time. And I do not envy the priests and the religious that have to do that every right. single day. Although it does become a circadian river after a while because right. you do remember and memorize it, especially Compline or Night Prayer. You memorize that quickly. And I imagine that other um recitatory prayers are like that. Like I imagine that um saying a rosary becomes much easier after you've done it a hundred or so times and then just becomes muscle memory. Absolutely. And Something we used to do here at Monarchist of America was pray the rosary on every weekday in the prayer VC. And if anyone wants to, if anyone wants to restart that, get in touch with me in my DMs. My DMs are open. You can get in touch with me if anybody wants to restart that. Because um, I would be open to doing that. I remember a few times joining you and trying to keep up with y'all doing that. I was beyond lost. <laughs> well, like you said, it's a circadian rhythm. When you get in rhythm, it's kind of hard to get out of rhythm and slow down. I personally will give my um credit where credit is due to the orthodox in regards to respiratory prayers where I am 
I very much like the Jesus prayer just because of how simplistic it is. Yeah. Um, most right, let... use the, the prayer VC. I just, you know, go to my prayer icon and, you know, do this and that. Yeah. Like, I don't mm -hmm. go to the prayer VC because I think it could be distracting towards my prayer. I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, you pray however you want to pray. But it's if you ever want to do like group prayers or group devotionals or everything, it's always open. It's open for the public. Anyone can use it and coordinate it. But mm -hmm. as a chaplain, I endorse its use openly. <laughs> yes, of course. And as the and and of course, and it is very important that we. And I tried to read a spiritual book for Lent, but I found it to be a little bit dense. Well, I mean, and the print I was and the print it. was small, so I had to squ and the print was small anyway, so I kind of had to squint a little bit. So that was the issue. I mean, I had a um similar problem. Uh, my goal for Lent was to give up things that I know distract me or things that might cause me to procrastinate and use that time to be more constructive and um, read yep. my Bible more, get closer to God. And all I have to say is I am incredibly disappointed in myself for how easily I managed to find yet even more distraction. And, you know, as a chaplain and as the spirit was who's supposed to be the spiritual guide in this server, I found in this organization, I found myself very disappointed with how I failed to get closer to God in these past five weeks. And I think I'm going to try even harder next year to give up even more things. You have, you, you have to, one week. You have one week left, and hey, there's no shame in giving up something smaller because you didn't accomplish the goal this year. I mean, yeah. I can always give you up more. Goals, I can say no teeth. Goals have to be attainable. I mean, you, I if you think always, it's attainable, go ahead. I mean, I can always just say I don't watch any TV for the rest of Holy Week, and that can be my penance for my lackluster performance. Um, that could be an option. Now, let's... Uh, now, the traditional teaching on fasting is that fasting, well, all forms of self-denial are men are are there to help you grow in virtue but fasting in particular yeah, um, traditionally is taught to help it's taught to help combat sins of the flesh yeah right it's supposed to help teach discipline and self-control and all that that helps with sins of the flesh and, and also um, to for Easter the you know, uh, all all I do say, however, is that since I gave up alcohol, I really miss beer. Like, hey, I think have you have you have you refrained from drinking throughout all of Lent? I have, but honestly, that's good for you. That is an accomplishment. You did what you set out to do. I've yeah, been I, I just, like I said, I just wish I had used the time in these past five weeks to actually get closer to God and help build my relationship. It's not that I'm not satisfied with keeping my fast because I have kept my fast for the most part. It's that I'm just not satisfied with what I reaching my goals, what I was supposed to be doing while I was fasting. Like I said, I just found new ways to distract myself from reading my Bible, saying my prayers, staying away from sin. Just um, <clears throat> also, I was thinking about um a chant bot for the prayer VC. If you know people want to do chants and stuff, like oh, that's an interesting idea. Like a um robot that might sing hymns or something, or like broadcast hymns. Yeah, something like that. 
Well, well I think we, would we have think... a music bot. I mean, theoretically, no, we... if we have the music bot, you could just bring the music bot into the chat and then just use that to play hymns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, could... I think, but don't. All right. Me. We can save this type of conversation for off the air. However, yeah. this is a very interesting conversation for those people who are not in the server. Link in the description. Link in the description. Come and join us. Or if you don't have Discord, if you don't have Discord, frankly, I can't blame you. <laughs> but anyway, you can also find us on Twitter. We already have an email. You can email us to get in touch with us directly. And we also have Facebook, um, Instagram. Instagram is ran by our favorite um human resources representative um thomas bright who himself i don't believe has a discord account does he not anymore but he is still act he's still working with us he's just off platform um hopefully in the future he'll be rejoining us on the podcast we're experimenting with a new um hosting platform but we're running into some issues with the logistics apparently you can only record with this platform on mobile so we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this but theoretically if we get this to work it will cut down on the amount of editing we need to do it will improve the um quality of our podcast and it will also allow us to have more hosts on at any one time yeah, and, and I'm also thinking about doing my own little, you know, podcast that, like, that's not a part, well, it's kind of a part of Marcus Minute, but it'd be, like, me one-on-one -on -one with, like, someone. I mean, that's a good idea, too. And, you know, we've had that before. before. Check out our casual conversation. Check out our casual conversations series on our YouTube channel. It and be that that yeah, would be a wonderful series. I would actually like to restart in the future, and maybe we can look into getting that started. Anyway, but, um, let us... Yeah, I could do, like, daily reporting on stuff. We also but... tried that, too. Unfortunately, that got memory hold. Yeah, it appears that brief news broadcasts weren't very popular, but anywho, we're... We are we are waffling we are waffling now. So I think that because we are waffling, it's time to sort of wrap things up. Mm. Unless um, anybody has anything else to speak about. I was also thinking about um letting people up here to ask questions. Oh, a Q and oh, an impromptu Q and A session. I can get down with that. So if anybody has any questions. You raise can either hand. raise your hand to join us up here, or you can type them out. Be sure to use Stages text chat for your questions, not the podcast stage text chat. That's over there beside one. Use Stages text chat for your questions, or you can raise your hand and come up here to ask your question. So you said you were trying to read a spiritual book and that it was kind of dense. What were you trying to read? I'm curious now. Uh, can you grab it? Because after I finished reading my Bible, I picked up a copy of the Aphrocrypia, and I was going to start reading that. Oh, that is that. So, um, it was a meditation on the Sacred Heart written by uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the, I suppose you can call her the foundress of the devotion of the Sacred Heart. I see. But yeah, I did pick up a copy of the Aphrocrypia, which is, for those of you who don't know what the Aphrocrypia is, the Aphrocrypia refers to those books in the Bible that weren't all canonized by the other churches. So like the oh, books yeah. that Martin Luther, like the um, books that Martin Luther removed from the Bible, those books that the yeah, Orthodox yeah. have in their Bible that the Catholics don't, and a few other extra biblical texts, but. Yeah, I believe he removed like seven of them. I for, I for, I forget the exact number of books in each Bible. I think the Protestant Bible has sixty eight, the Catholic has seventy six, and the um, Orthodox is eighty one. But don't quote me on that. And then, of course, because 
the Ethiopians have 85 in their mind. Which is which is way too much. So let us uh on that note. Mm -hmm. I think it is time for us to wrap up. Now, yeah. I would like to add a prayer after the end of the Our Father. So, Will, would you like to lead us in the Our Father? Uh, yes, one moment. I'm just getting the timestamp. All right. Please bow your head and pray in the manner you are accustomed. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And... Eternal Father, Eternal well, Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of, of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Christ became obedient, even unto death, even death on a cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, until next time... Don't may forget. God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. And Check us forget. out in the links in the description below, and have a happy Easter. We will see you all in two weeks. Again, God bless. Christ, Christ is risen, and he died to save us all from our sins. Make sure you remember that this week. May Holy Week begin. Amen. Amen.